Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today we're going to be looking at the 21 finest games, in our opinion, for the Nintendo Switch that came out in its third year. I'm aware we're doing this marginally early, but there's NAF all coming out between now and uh, the 3rd of March 2020, so we just thought we'd do it. These, in our humble objective subjective opinions, are the very best games to come to Nintendo's latest system in between the dates of the 3rd of March 2019 and the 2nd of March 2020, the Switch's third year. Well, I couldn't include my top choice because... Apparently DLC doesn't count as a real game, it's, it's all politics. These are also going to be done in no particular order, and to make sure that they absolutely aren't, I've got the list up here on a randomizer, and I'm going to randomize them right about now. But anyway, that's more than enough waffling, let's dive right into things. Kicking things off, we have Luigi's Mansion 3, unsurprisingly the third game in the Luigi's Mansion series. Aside from being an enormous amount of fun to just play, this is also probably the finest, most delicious looking game on the Switch. I mean, just look at it. And even then, it looks even tastier in person as games always do, you know, all that lossless quality and everything. All the new mechanics they bring in, the lighting effects, the genuine, genuine kind of scares every so often is nothing major by any means, but it's still sort of, ooh. It ends up just being a wonderful game suitable for all ages, and more importantly, it has a fair old amount of the older Snoopy Snoo trying to find little things here and there, which is um, is important and also um, bloody difficult at times. Next up, we've got Ring Fit Adventure. Now, there may be some people out there saying, why is a fitness game being included on this list? Well, because it's an incredibly important game because of just the way it plays. Nintendo and indeed other companies have tried to introduce fitness into their games through things like uh, Wii Fit and even things like Dance Dance Revolution, but I genuinely believe that no game does it better than Ring Fit Adventure because it is an actual proper game and the Ring Con, the whole screen squeezy screw thing that you gotta do, that thing is tasty. When it was first revealed, a lot of people, myself included, were very quick to poo-poo it, and to be honest, I think part of that was due to the initial reveal video being terrifying, but I am still playing Ring Fit Adventure to this day. It is genuinely really tough, you can really genuinely work up a sweat and that's not just some terrifying marketing line. And what's more, the RPG you're playing within it isn't absolutely catastrophically amazing, but it's good enough to actually genuinely hold your attention as a game as well, and when you combine it with the fact that you should be playing it because we could all do with a little bit more exercise here and there, this is just out and out, this is just a triumph from start to finish. What do you do when you can't be bothered to make a full new Zelda game? You just make an old one new again. And that's exactly what they did with The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. It's the Link- it's Link's Awakening. Link's Awakening has always held a very, very special place in my heart. I think just largely because it was the first Zelda game I ever played. And as a result, I- I mean, I do know the game like the back of my hand, and it is not the longest adventure in the world. But considering that this was originally an 8-bit game on a Game Boy, which is like massively, massively underpowered by modern standards and even by standards back then. And the fact that they can get this much gameplay and this much goodness in there, they clearly did something right. And do it right they did, and this latest version with all the spit and polish you'd expect of a Switch game is probably easily the best way to play it, to be brutally honest. I'll always have an affinity for the original, but the new version, it's its the most convenient and the shiniest way to play it, and oh, it's a good time. It's one of those Zelda games that doesn't have Ganondorf or anything like that in it, which means it's really unique, really unusual, and really, really good. <laughs> Oh my lord, let me count the ways in which I love Cuphead. The nub of Cuphead's gameplay is it is essentially a shooter, a relatively simple shooter, at least in terms of mechanics, but <laughs> the execution is just something else. I mean, this game not only looks utterly, utterly drop-dead gorgeous with all those hand-animated 
animations, but the gameplay despite being simple is beautifully, beautifully refined, and <laughs> it is cripplingly difficult at times. But I think given the nature of the game, that it's all about trial and error and learning how a boss behaves and things like that. It's all about learning things and then sort of applying that knowledge and getting through to the end, and I think that's kind of fair. The fact that the, the battles are technically over so quickly means that I, th I think it's largely forgivable and you just start straight back at the beginning. It's really quick. Honestly, if you if you love being beaten to death time and time again, you can't beat this. Moving on, we've got Dragon Quest XI S Echoes of an Elusive Age, which is a long title. But crikey is this a game and a half despite the convoluted nature of its name. In many ways it's a quintessential JRPG, there's nothing absolutely crazy going on here with loads of different sort of unique capabilities or everything, but just like Cuphead, it is just beautifully and wonderfully executed. The graphics pop, the characters are engaging, the fights are fun, the fights can actually be a Avoided, you're not doing that old typical Final Fantasy nonsense, so you can just actually play the game as you want to. Honestly, if you're a JRPG fan and you haven't played this one, what rock have you been living under? One that may have passed a few people by, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. Now to say the original Ukulele launched flawlessly and was everything everyone ever expected would be a, a massive lie. So if you're a little bit wary of the name in this new game, then I wouldn't blame you. However, I mean, this is nothing like the original, like it, just gameplay wise, is nothing like it. And you know what? Holy gravy, is it a good time. As you can probably tell, if you know your Donkey Kong Country it's very similar to Donkey Kong Country. It's the third game in a row, actually, that has a very simple gameplay loop, but is executed so wonderfully as to just make the fact that the gameplay is arguably simple, because the way that it's done is just so exceptional. One thing that I think a lot of 2D platformers miss out on is a sense of flow and momentum, and thankfully Ukulele in the Impossible Lair didn't. There is nothing more satisfying than getting everything just right, bouncing off of enemies and trying to climb things and just missing oh it's just it's just wonderful give it a go Oh lordy, this is going to be one for contention. Yes, Pokemon Sword and Shield. I honestly don't think there's been a game released for the Nintendo Switch that has been as divisive as this. Good gravy. Is it my personal favourite Pokemon game? No. Is it objectively the best in the series? Maybe not. I mean, it does a lot of things right, but it has quite a few foibles as well. It's still a Pokemon game and it's still got that infectious, addictive gameplay loop that, well, is one of the reasons why Pokemon is so bloomin' popular. That and all the merch. I don't begrudge anyone who doesn't like these games, you are more than entitled to your own personal opinion. However, for me, I think Pokemon Sword and Shield is probably some of the most fun I've had with the series in a long time. The wild area alone, for all its warts, is absolutely wonderful and really, really is the direction the series needs to take. Please. Astral Chain. Now, I can't even say that this is one of the unsung heroes or hidden gems of the Switch. This thing did gangbusters. It sold like crazy. And when you consider that it's a brand new IP and it was only released on a single system, not multi plat or anything, that's really impressive and Christ and blimey does it deserve it. This is one of the slickest, most enjoyable, just one of the most original games I've played in a long, long time. It's so good that you have people who don't own a Switch complaining and actively, like, arguably in certain instances, attacking the developers and publishers, saying, guys, bring it to other platforms, it's you don't care about the gamers, or something like that. I think one of my favourite things about the game is the world building. It really does feel like you are in a new world without giving just bombarding you with loads of details it's just so well crafted that you believe you are in that world and you believe everything that's happening is possible nothing seems to ott or outlandish despite the fact that everything is ott and outlandish it's really really special 
Next up, we've got Collection of Mana. It's a load of mana games in one spicy package. We really tried to avoid including collections of games, but considering this one contains a game that was never released over here, yeah, we kind of felt like it, it deserved a pass, because, yeah, Trials of Mana. Oh. The Mana series is one that basically passed me by my entire life until it came to me to do a video review of this game that someone else had written. Don't worry, they didn't get me to do it, because that would have been bad. And even though the games are old, they are unbelievably gripping, like, there is something really special about the way these games are written, and uh, especially considering for the Super Nintendo, the translations are pretty bloody amazing. And what's more, it's not turn-based, it's an action RPG, which honestly is a breath of fresh air for me at times. Oh yeah, there's some other games included as well. ESP Ra De Sai. Now, if you can tell from the way I've pronounced that, I have no idea what this game is. Thankfully, I'm not a one-man band, and so I've actually had the help of one of my bosses to uh, help me guide you through why this game deserves to be on this list, because honestly, I'd never bloody heard of it. This game is a shmup, or a shoot 'em up if you prefer, and frankly, it is just absolutely excellent. It's a prime example of the genre, and arguably the best available on the Switch, even beating out the mighty Ikaruga, if you can believe it. Originally an arcade game, this is a beautiful and perfect recreation of the arcade original, thanks largely to the Switch being a powerful little monster. It's definitely a niche game, we're not gonna lie about that, but even so, if this is your kind of thing, if you're into these kinds of games, then this is easily one you should not be missing out on. Look at all the bullets, there's so many bullets, it's almost like it's a hell of bullets. If you're watching this now and you think, hey, I kind of like these kind of games, then it's one that you shouldn't even be considering, you should just already be downloading. Hop to it. Alien Isolation. Proof that the way a game is made is more important than active just raw power. Sometimes. I mean, you can run this on a SNES, admittedly. Besides just being a great game through and through, this is easily one of the best ports for the Nintendo Switch. I mean, it runs largely at 1080p. I mean, it's a dynamic resolution, and I've got to send a lot of thanks to Digital Foundry for working out all these fancy numbers. But due to a number of clever little trickeries here and there, this version actually arguably looks better than the version on the PS4 and the Xbox One. That's just bonkers. I feel like we're currently in a Switch port arms race, and honestly, that's like the best thing that could happen for the Switch. People competing to see who could make the best one. It's, oh, we're in a good timeline. Step over Skyrim, it's, it's The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Another porting masterpiece. I mean, okay, yeah, it doesn't look that great. It's a little bit blurry and all that, you know, low resolution. Uh, we get it, everyone knows it. It's still The Witcher 3 running on the Switch, which is basically, essentially, a mobile phone. That's crazy. It's also undoubtedly one of the best open world games, well, just generally. I mean, on the Switch, obviously, but also just generally. The world is just alive! I mean, these characters you're interacting with feel like real people. The dialogue is genuine. Okay, Geralt sometimes talks to himself in monologue form, and that's kind of a bit funny, but uh, how else would you do it rather than just text on screen? If you think Skyrim is the epitome of what a fantasy open world RPG can be, then do yourself a favor, toss a coin to your Witcher. It's just poor, poor, poor at the moment. Yes, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. A bizarre game that's bizarre. This is a game unlike any other, and if you're looking at this thinking, how on earth is the Switch capable of producing graphics like this? Well, that's due to a clever sort of series of blending gameplay visuals and pre-rendered cutscenes to create a sort of a seamless effect, and by golly does it work. I should mention that this is a game that is just flat out not suitable for children in any way, shape, or form. I mean, the same could be said for The Witcher 3 and, well, Alien Isolation as well. I did randomize these, I promise. There are a lot of very adult and very tough topics managed here, but they are done so with the utmost respect, and the result is... it's just pure magic. I really don't want to say too much because this is one of those games where it really, really is best experienced firsthand, but if you feel like having a brand new experience like nothing you've ever done before, you, my god, this is like top of the list. 
We're still in the realm of fantasy, guys. Yes, it's Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. This is again a port of an older game that peculiarly just sort of fell off the face of the earth for a long time. I mean, it had its followers, but they weren't nearly as many. It kind of got drowned down by other games. And what a ruddy shame it is, because this is a phenomenal game. It doesn't specifically excel in any one area or have some sort of special shiny feature that makes it stand out. But everything it does, it just does really, really well. Like, even the combat's fun in a, in a fantasy RPG. I know. Can you believe it? Another fantasy RPG. Untitled Goose Game. First of all, let's get the bad stuff out of the way with Untitled Goose Game. It's too short. It's because you just want to play it forever. There is no other game out there like this game. Like, it is just honestly, utterly, 100% unique. And no doubt, just because of the memes and everything, you've probably already seen a fair deal of it and heard about it and you've seen all the goose memes flying around, which, by the way, are brilliant. But honestly, this game deserves so, so much more. Again, just like Hellblade, it's one of those games you need to experience firsthand. That's one of the reasons why we're showing you only very limited footage right now. If the game hasn't been spoiled for you, I, I just, I, I cannot recommend enough that you do not look into a single other thing about the game. You just download it and you play it because that is the best way to experience it. That just looking it up will just spoil everything and that's just not the way it should be played. Super Mario Maker 2. Why is it on this list? Well, it's actually surprisingly simple. The only game on this list to get a perfect 10 out of 10 outstanding from us, and for damned good reason, it's just the best 2D Mario game. Everything about the original Super Mario Maker has been improved upon. There's an endless supply of really excellent levels out there. It's just, you just, you don't need another 2D Mario after this one. They've included slopes for God's sake. I don't really feel like I can say much else that does the game justice because we've already done a big chuffing review about it. I'm pretty sure I did that one as well. I've reviewed a lot of these games. If you're watching this video, you've probably already played it or you at least know about the games. So just go and play it, come on, Do I, I can't say any more than that. The surprise indie gem of last year, The Tourist. This is from the same people who brought us this. The Tourist, however, is a strange little game. You're just thrown in with no real objective. You just kind of go around and you just kind of do stuff. It's really, really unusual. But unlike a traditional sandbox game like Minecraft or something, everything is tailored, everything is specific. There are objectives that you need to complete if you want to, but you have to find them yourself. There's also little arcade games and they're adorable. Also, I'm sure you've probably already noticed unless you're watching this on mobile and it's at 30 frames a second, this game runs absolutely spectacularly. Like this is 1080p most of the time and 60 frames a second all the time. And just look at that lighting. This game is just unbelievably well designed. It's also tiny. It's like, what, a couple of gigabytes? The numbers on the screen, because I don't know. It's strange, it's unfamiliar, it's a really unusual game, and one that you really, really need to give a go. Oh, it's Fire Emblem Three Houses, baby! Another critically acclaimed game that you've no doubt already heard of, but blimey, blimey, does this belong on here. It's always a little bit scary when a series makes the leap from being on handheld for so long, I know it was on the GameCube, don't at me, onto a much more powerful system like the Switch, but they have done it, and they have done it beautifully. This is, in my opinion, probably the best Fire Emblem game out there, and I know that that may be a controversial thing for some people, particularly people who've played Awakening, but the game just does so many things right. There's weight in everything you do. You can't experience everything the game has to offer in a single playthrough because it's designed that way. If you really want to lose yourself in characters and lore and really become attached to some people that just flat out don't exist, mate, this is one for you. Stay with me now. Metroidvanias, that's a silly name for a genre, but Ori in the Blind Forest is a bloody good one. Originally an Xbox and Windows exclusive, Microsoft were just like, hey, Nintendo, go for it, dude. And what a game. Seriously, this is just one beautiful adventure from start to finish. Not only visually, but thematically and just gameplay-y. Unsurprisingly, it reminds me a lot of things like Hollow Knight, and whilst I wouldn't say that personally Ori in the Blind Forest is as good as Hollow Knight, 
site. And that really is by only a very, very few small points. And part of it being... I have a ridiculous affinity for Hollow Knight. Metroid, Hollow Knight, Castlevania, if you love any of those series, you've got to play this one, my god, you've got to play this one. Sayonara Wild Hearts. Can you tell what it is from the trailer? No, no, that's that's about standard. The only way I can really describe the genre of this game is almost an interactive music video? I, I, it's something so unusual, it's really difficult to fit it in a box. At least with Untitled Goose Game, you could call it like a goose simulator or something. But as I'm sure I don't need to tell you from just watching this, this is just one seriously stylish game. I don't think anything else on the Switch even comes close to this. The neon colors, the rhythmic gameplay, the, it's just so unusual, so wonderful and so bizarre. It is sadly over a little bit too quickly, like even more so than Untitled Goose Game, but even so, I still think you'll be richer for playing this game. It's just, it's just like a fever dream, a weird, beautiful nightmare of a game. And I love it. And finally, another game based on rhythm and timing beats. I did randomize these! Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necrodancer featuring the Legend of Zelda, manages to beat Dragon Age for title of the most ridiculous name. In a nutshell, this is a Zelda game that you play to the beat, like to the music. I mean, it's arguably a little bit simpler than most Zelda games in certain regards, but the fact that you've got to do pretty much everything to a strict rhythm, and if you don't, then things start going badly for you very, very, very quickly, makes the whole thing a hugely rewarding time. I mean, like, this is proper tickling your corpus callosum until you get all the happy juices flowing. It does take a little bit of time to to get used to, but when you do get it down, my god, this game is just beautiful. And what's more, it's just had a free update. I say just, I mean, it happened a while ago, but it's had a free update. There's loads of new stuff to do. Go and play the stuff, do it, play it, love it. And there you have it, the 21 very best games for the Nintendo Switch, according to not just me. But what were your favourite games released for the Switch between the dates of the 3rd of March 2019 and the 2nd of March 2020? Let us know down there in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then why don't you scream where was Tetris 99 of that subscribe button before realising it was released in January last year. And be sure to check out NintendoLife.com for all sorts of lovely Nintendo related content. Thank you again for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>